Yeah, yeah but there's a lot of good eating on a muskrat. <laughs> <laughs> Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern bar cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 200 of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. I just want to say that one more time because it feels good. Welcome to episode 200. In the weeks leading up to this, I've had a few people ask me how one makes it to 200 episodes. And the unglamorous answer is if you put out an episode roughly every week over the course of four years, you just sort of end up here. But it is a momentous number and I have a couple momentous guests joining me to celebrate David Wondrich is the senior drinks columnist at The Daily Beast and the author of such books as Imbibe and Punch. Noah Rothbaum is the half-full editor for The Daily Beast, former founding editor-in-chief at Liquor.com, and the author of books like The Business of Spirits, The Art of American Whiskey, and the forthcoming Whiskey Bible. Additionally, these two gentlemen host one of my favorite podcasts, Life Behind Bars, and they are the combined editorial force behind the Oxford Companion to Spirits and Cocktails, which will be released this coming October by Oxford University Press. This latest book is the project we're here to celebrate and discuss, but before we do that, I have one quick announcement that will give you even more to celebrate. Just in time for episode 200, I am proud to announce that we are partnering with Barfly to bring you a whole bunch of amazing, high-quality bar tools. Not only will this improve on our current selection, but it has allowed us to branch out and offer more great merchandise like Lewis bags, ice tongs, and more. And as if that wasn't enough, I'm going to toss you a big 20% discount for episode 200. Through August 31st, head on over to modernbarcart.com and take 20% off your entire purchase. No code, still free shipping for orders over 40 bucks, just straight up discounts and even a few awesome closeouts on items we really want to send to a good home. You know we've always got your back when it comes to making and enjoying better drinks at home, and I couldn't be happier to partner with Barfly to help make that happen. Now, back to the interview. In this wide-ranging conversation with Noah Rothbaum and David Wondrich, some of the topics we cover include how Dave transitioned from English professor to Esquire columnist to full-fledged cocktail historian, and how that journey brought him to collaborate with Noah at the Daily Beast, and on their current Oxford Companion project. The difference between writing about spirits and cocktails in the early 2000s versus today, and how our relationship to the truth, in quotes here, is different than it was during those early days of our great cocktail revival. Why long-form booze writing has paradoxically spawned a lot of attention and accolades in today's age of listicles and tweet threads, and how conducting historical research is very similar to noodling for catfish. Along the way, we discuss why Beach Bum Berry is so bent out of shape about the Pini Colada, where Dave hid that lump of ambergris he's been missing for the past several years, the merits of a good, solid rum punch, and much, much more. This interview ended up being a historiography of the cocktail renaissance and an examination of what it really means to know something about a spirit or cocktail. Both Noah and Dave are responsible for massive bodies of work and have intersected and collaborated with the most influential drinks authors and icons of our time. I couldn't be more grateful to have both these gentlemen as guests, it definitely ticks off a couple dream interviews on my podcast bucket list, so without further ado, please enjoy this enlivening and enlightening conversation with David Wondrich and Noah Rothbaum. Noah and Dave, welcome to the podcast. How are you? <laughs> Thank you so much for having us on. I appreciate it. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Noah, why don't you begin by just telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do, then we'll go to Dave, and uh, then we'll jump into this interview. Sure. Um, my name is Noah Rothbaum. I'm the 
Daily Beast Half Full Editor. I'm also uh, the co-host of the podcast Life Behind Bars and uh, the author of the books The Business of Spirits, The Art of American Whiskey, uh, the forthcoming Whiskey Bible, and of course, the associate editor of the Oxford Companion to Spirits and Cocktails. Amazing. Amazing. Dave, how about you? I'm the uh, senior drinks columnist at the Daily Beast, uh, formerly at Esquire for very many years, author of Imbibe and Punch and a number of other books, and editor-in-chief of the uh, forthcoming Oxford Companion, of course, and also co-host of uh, Life Behind Bars. So, uh, yeah. Noah and I work together a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we like it, I hope. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. I have pulled up here my uh, couple signed editions of uh, Punch and Imbibe. And uh, no, I, I don't think I've been in a room with you before, but Dave, I wanted to give you a few touch points uh, so that, that you you may, at least in your head, be able to to think of when we we may have crossed paths in the past, definitely remember being with you here in D.C. when you uh, you did a, a talk over over here in Petworth with Dan Searing uh, about I think it was about punch. Yes, it was. That was fun. Mm-hmm. It was it was really good. And and there was also uh, of course at the last in person tales of the cocktail there was a, a really fun little duet you did with everybody's favorite beach bum uh, Jeff Barry about the history of cocktail menus which uh, i thought was just tremendously fun oh we we love doing that that uh, you know jeff and i every year we would do our our history thing and uh that's always a good time and always very informative for me because jeff knows everything so uh uh and uh, we try to make it light and amusing and uh, serve some decent drinks <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You guys, you guys uh, did a great job. I really enjoyed the. Um, uh, it was the the bar in Boston with the moral suasion? What was what was that that bar? Uh, well, it was the uh, Oyster Saloon in mm. the concert hall in in Boston, run by uh, Peter Bent Brigham, who uh, when he died endowed Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is still there and going strong, uh, on a strong foundation of booze. It turns out so. What the hell? <laughs> it's yeah. funny. I love that, Dave, you were able to recall all of that, like just off the cuff. I would have been like, uh, yeah, the Boston thing. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, for these days, no, it's about 50-50, I got to say. That makes so uh, I lucked out on that one, but uh, <laughs> the other ones are going to go right over my head. <laughs> well, that that might get us into the the project that you're currently working on. But one, the one last thing I, I will say, just to see if maybe you recall just a little bit about it, is that that you and I, Dave, may have been in the same room when there was a, a cognac tasting seminar at Tales. This might have been in 2017, and uh, somebody I don't remember who it was, but somebody busted out some some ambergris contraband and decided to make a cocktail with it. Whew. I don't remember. Uh, do you do you remember that? I remember uh, that it happened. <laughs> Tales of the cocktail and memory are not two things that really live together uh, in, in great harmony in my head. But uh, uh, I do have a piece of ambergris in, in my house somewhere that I've used before. I know this was not me, though, because I haven't found my piece uh-huh. in a couple of years. I put it in a safe place and it's a, a little too safe of a place. Uh, but one of these days I'm going to find it again and, and uh-huh. uh, use it for, for punch. Amazing. Well, um, let's let's begin with a little bit of history here, because you both have uh, a number of books under your belt, as, as we previously stated. And uh, I want to give folks just the 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 10,000 foot view so that we can understand what you're taking into this current project which is definitely one of the more ambitious book projects that we've featured to date so um i guess dave can can you take us through the basics of your transition from being a university professor into when you started writing about drinks and how that spawned imbibe and punch and then we'll talk about noah your books and and how you two came together as uh sort of collaborators in chief here for for your podcast and and your current project yeah sure uh <laughs> i was uh an english professor at uh, st john's university here in new york and I really, really hated that job. I was not cut out for it. I like the researching part. I like 
even to a degree, God help me, the writing part, but the teaching part is fine. What I didn't like is the professoring part, the faculty meetings and all that kind of stuff. It just, uh, it, it seemed like I was uh, just going to dry up and blow away in that job. Uh, so uh, I started writing about music on the side, and that ended up getting me a gig at the uh, Village Voice, which then was a big deal. And uh, from that, for the Sunday Times, I wrote some articles on, uh, I, I mostly wrote about old jazz and hillbilly music and stuff like that, heritage music. And it got me a book deal, and I started working on that. And at some point uh, at the very end of 1999, a friend of mine was working in the then new field of new media, they called it, digital media, for Hearst Magazines. And uh, he said, Esquire has a little project. Could we, we hire you to do that? I know you like to write, and uh, I know that you uh, like cocktails, and it's a, can you put this cocktail book online for us? And I was like, no, I can't. I'm a junior professor. I'm busy as hell. It's just not possible. He said, well, it pays $3,000. I was like, when do you need it? Uh, so uh, that was uh, that was just a weird in through the side door beginning that ended up being a monthly, uh, I'm sorry, a weekly column on, on Esquire.com and then a monthly column in the magazine and then a book. And then that book got me into helping put together a tribute to Jerry Thomas at the Plaza Hotel with Slow Food. And that uh, in turn became Imbibe, the uh, project to uh, bring Jerry Thomas's recipes to the modern world to, you know, illuminate his life and the conditions he worked under. And uh, then that uh, led to the punch book, which was the half of the Imbibe manuscript that I had to cut out when I turned it in because I went over the word count so uh, egregiously. That uh, in turn led me to the Oxford book, which my friend Garrett Oliver pulled me aside one day and took me to the local bar. He had just finished the beer book and had come out to great acclaim, deservedly so. And uh, he said, Oxford asked me, you know, what else uh, we should do? I said, cocktails. They said, who should do it? Well, uh, you should meet my friend Dave. So I kind of got seduced into that one, too. That was, uh, (laughs) I signed the contract for that book in 2011-2012, so a very long time ago, and started plugging away on it on my own until I realized I was in way over my head. That's when I called Noah. (laughs) Seven years ago, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It took you about two, three years to realize that you were in over your head with this. Uh, Noah, what what were you doing around that time, maybe uh, leading up to the point when Dave called you about the Oxford Companion? Yeah, yeah sure. Well, I, it's funny, like, I, you know, I had really been exposed to sort of cocktails and spirits. I had done a internship at Food and Wine in the summer of 99 um, and under a new editor uh, that nobody had ever heard of named Pete Wells, who's obviously now the food critic of the Times. Um, it had been the food editor. But Pete had been part of the original crew for Time Out New York and was super into cocktails and bars and had done all that reporting for them. And when he came into it, he was that was one of his personal interests. And, you know, I got to meet people like Dale DeGroff, who was still working. You know, he was still at Blackbird. And it was one of these things where it was just I always knew that I wanted to be a journalist. Um, but it sort of blew my mind. You know, we, we had also the editor in chief of Savor had talked to our the ASME group that I, the ASME uh, program that I participated in. And, you know, it was one of these things where it just sort of blew my mind. But, you know, you know, the following year when I graduated, it was, it was one of these things that not that many people really wanted to publish writing about cocktails and spirits. Like you could do it maybe around Father's Day, Mother's Day, Cinco de Mayo, the Kentucky Derby. St. Patrick's Day and the holidays. And that was it. Other than that, people really did not want to read about cocktails and spirits, right? It just wasn't something that people are interested in. And, um, you know, for, for a number of years, I walked, I worked at, uh, smart money, the wall street journals, my magazine, not about how to make money, but how to spend it and wrote about drinks whenever I could. And for other people like gastronomica and others. And, then I left to write my first book, The Business of Spirits, which is sort of about 
trend stories, you know, sort of trends in, in the cocktails and spirits world, and then was freelancing for a couple of years, and then was the founding editor in chief of liquor.com. I was the, you know, sort of created all the content for that. The, the owners came to me with the Ural, but, but really no site. And, and for that, like, I was able to get people like Dave and Wayne Curtis and, um, you know, a whole roster, Dale DeGrave, a whole roster of other people to write for it. And then after about four and a half years, I left that and I was working on finishing up the art of American whiskey. And Dave was like, uh, you know, you left liquor.com. I think you have a little bit of time on your hands now. And I was like, <laughs> I have a little, little bit of time. Like, what, 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 what? Yeah. I was like, what, what are you thinking? And this was like 2014. <laughs> it was the winter. Yeah of 2014 i was like yeah what, what you know what I'm, I'm looking for projects what's going on and it was one of these things where it was like you know absolutely count me in this is amazing and i and in the back of my head i thought okay we'll work on this for like you know maybe two three years like how long could it take right like tops you know just a few years so then uh you know <laughs> that obviously it took a little longer to, <laughs> Yeah, you know, but but also it, to be honest, it's one of these things where you know, in between, like um, I started writing a column for the Wall Street Journal, and then for uh, the Daily Beast, wanted you know they they had done a survey and they had realized that you know that one area that the readers really were interested in, but they didn't have content for it was cocktails and spirits, and to you know, and to a lesser degree, food. So I started writing a column with the idea if that was that worked, then I would come on to build a section, and then. You know, obviously that was like a, a two-year plan or something, but it sped up. So, you know, I started, you know, writing and, and then, you know, soon enough, you know, uh, I was able to uh, get Dave to come over and, and uh, some other folks from Esquire. And then, you know, the timing was very fortuitous. You know, uh, Wayne Curtis was looking for a new um, kind of writing um, home um, and, and so was Lou Bryson and, you know, Dave Broom and, you know, all, all these other people, Becky Paskin. So, I mean, it's been kind of like this amazing experience to put together half full and, um, you know, it's been really a sort of a wonderful thing. And we kind of broke all the rules. We didn't, we don't do listicles. We don't rate things. We don't, you know, do uh, top 10 lists. You know, we, you know, when everybody told us that we couldn't do long form, we did long form. Some of the most popular stories are, you know, huge pieces that Dave wrote that, you know, were wonderful, you know, and, 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 and got some of the most traffic that we've ever gotten, you know, so it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. It's, you know, we, we broke all the modern internet rules, but kind of succeeded. <laughs> and, um, Unfortunately, yeah. yeah, which has been wonderful. And in kind of keeping to the ethos of the daily beast is all about intersections and here it's sort of drinks and food and, and pop culture and society. And, and thankfully people have really you know, enjoyed reading the stories and, we won two Tales of the Cocktail Awards for Best Publication. So I think we're DQ'd out of that now. <laughs> so um, we, we won one for uh, Life Behind Bars a couple of years ago. And that was something that Dave and I had, you know, almost from the minute he came on, sort of the whole medium of podcasts was, I think it's sort of like skateboards. It sort of comes around every couple of years. And, you know, it had been uh, one of these things where it was just coming back into vogue and, Dave and I were both interested in doing it and just storytelling. So many of the, you know, no matter how long a story is that's written, you often have to leave out, you know, all these amazing, you know, sidebars and stories that sort of are interesting but don't quite fit. And, and obviously in a podcast, you know, you can go into all of those tangents and, you know. Uh, yeah, it's a chance to sort of to go behind the story a little bit. Absolutely. And to uh, go around the story and uh, – to kind of <laughs> recreate the stories as barroom chatter, which is where they belong, you know, originally. Yeah. It's kind of to bring things back to that where it's, you know, this is just yeah. interesting stuff to talk about and not something that needs to be like handled with rigorous exposition. So it gives us a chance to to, to sort of take a, a different perspective on on what we're working on. So that that I really enjoy. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's sort of like... Uh what our, our old friend Gary Regan would always call like, you know, the crack in a bar, you know, the talk and, you know, that kind of that good vibe. And, you know, I think when at its best, the podcast can be like that. I mean, obviously there are all types of podcasts, you know, and there, are, God knows there, there's one for every person it seems out there and it seems like everybody <laughs> has one, at least one, maybe several, but, you know, ours, it's, you know, try to, you know, kind of, 
especially in the last year and a half, kind of really maybe make people feel like they're in a bar with, with some old friends having a drink and talking about stuff and going down a few rabbit holes and get a few mm -hmm. stories to share with their friends and loved ones. So. Yeah, absolutely. I want to return to Life Behind Bars because it's uh, definitely one of my favorite podcasts. But I want to readdress something that you said about the Daily Beast, Noah, about how long form is sort of taboo these days. They're not taboo. It's just, you know, that there, there's certain assumptions made about people's attention yeah. spans that I think are fundamentally faulty assumptions in that it's like, well, <laughs> did, did, did you consider like relevance or act like how actually interesting right. a subject is before factoring in how long somebody is willing to pay attention to this for? Because one of my favorite articles, and we actually did an episode, I did a little audio essay episode specifically recapping this article. So here you have a, a long form article respawning another long form ish piece of content, but mm -hmm. it was uh, the Plato and Aristotle walk into a bar. Oh yeah. Which to me, it was one of these things that I, I mean, I also have a little bit of university teaching experience. I was an English teacher at the university of Maryland for a little while before, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those gigs where if somebody offered me $3,000 to do anything at that point, I would have jumped ship as well. Oh yeah. So oh yeah. I, I know where you're coming from. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> So I tend to like to think in these, you know, structured ways. And so when I mm -hmm. when I saw this Plato and Aristotle walk into a bar, I'm like, oh, well, at least there will be an, a fun conceit here. And then after reading this, I had a completely different way of breaking down and analyzing any cocktail that I walk up to. I can take the platonic or the Aristotelian approach and and obviously the, the storytelling about the tea punch and the caipirinha and the daiquiri were all just you know, definitely handled as usual. So I personally am really grateful that you, you both and the daily beast are willing to go ahead and say like, no, we're going to go ahead and break that long form rule. We're going to go ahead and leave the listicles on the sidebar. Um, so, and for what it's worth, I, I really wow. enjoyed that article. I thought it was a lot of fun. Wow. I, I, I'm so glad. Thank you. I mean, that article meant a lot, uh, you know, a lot to me because it's stuff I've been thinking about for a very long time. And for me, basically, the article is about how some drinks are almost uh, unseparatable from their uh, from their process, and they're not. You you can't change the process without uh, kind of ruining the drink. The process is the drink, and uh, and then you know others are, are, are just don't have that, and they're you know different traditions of bartending that are embodied in these processes, different processes and ways of doing things. And if you try to standardize everything, you're losing the soul of the drink is the basic uh, conceit. But uh, that's stuff that I've been thinking about for a very long time. And I finally found a way of, uh, of, of articulating it that at least uh, I, I thought would be comprehensible. <laughs> you know, Because that's the hard part is with long form. And, uh, you know, long form, I have a habit of going way too long uh, on occasion, like the uh, 12,000 words I devoted to the history of the uh, of the old Absinthe House in New Orleans. I wasn't going to bring that up. I think it's a three, whatever Dave calls it. Four parts. Says, four parts. <laughs> you were like, I, uh, it's going, but I found a lot of interesting stuff. And I think um, we may want to run this as two pieces. Then I, yeah. then I know it's going to be a long you know, if we if we if we still typeset, I'd have to call the printer. I'd have to call like <laughs> the line of type machine. Be like, it's going to be a long night, buddy. Um, well, you know, the world is a complicated place. <laughs> but, but to be honest, that those again, I mean, I think it's you know, long form for the sake of long form doesn't doesn't really work either, right? And I, no. and and for some stories, I understand, right? You know, obviously that's why Twitter's successful. That's why USA Today is successful. You know, for some stories, you just you want to get to the, you know, who won the Yankee game, who won the NBA championship, right? Like, what's right. the weather going to be like? What what's the top line news, right? Boom, you've got it all in five minutes, right? But long form, I mean, you really, it's all about storytelling, right? And it's about good stories and finding good stories in the way that you tell it and. Dave makes it look really easy, but it's incredibly hard. I mean, that's that's the truth of the matter. And it takes a lot of skill and a lot of time and a lot of knowledge. And I and I think, you know, you know, you know, you you read, you know, Dave Wondrich or Wayne Curtis or Luke Bryson or some of our other amazing writers, and 
you read these stories and you're like, you know, it's, it's like whenever I read like, you know, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, right. You read his book and you're like, Oh my God, I too will be a novelist. And then you try to sit <laughs> down and you're like, Nope, <laughs> no, I don't think so. Right. Like there's yeah. a reason why, you know, Marquez is uh, so good. And I think again, it, it's, you know, that some of the, these are truly the best of the best. Right. And, 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 you know, not only, you know, do they recognize really good stories or, or, and make really good arguments, but they're, they're able to tell those stories. And, you know, Lou wrote a piece a, a couple of months ago, I guess in the winter about how, you know, American whiskey got, has gotten so, you know, kind of overhyped and overpriced and, you know, the, they're, the distillers are putting out like, you know, ever older bottlings that are, very very you know expensive but like as it turns out like all the distillers themselves prefer whiskey that's much younger right and that and that broke the internet i mean that was a very long well-reasoned but a fabulous read and then dave and i did an episode of life behind bars on that also you know that's our most successful Mm -hmm. episode And, and, and it's one of those things because it's a really controversial topic but one that you know was impeccably researched and backed up and you had the people who are making the whiskey basically saying to Lou like yeah I don't I don't drink that's I don't like that either basically. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I this I prefer six to eight year old basically yeah and it's, a, and it's a really interesting it was a really interesting story in progress but again like you you need decades of experience and, and and knowledge to to really pull that together and pull it off like in a way that's enjoyable so uh, I you know it's uh, I'm very as you could tell I'm very proud of it you also need a sympathetic editor who's going to uh, understand where you're going with this and kind of believe that right. you're going to pull it off and you're going to stick the landing because uh, yeah. otherwise you could just go on and on. And there are a number of articles that I've written 4,000 words on that I've abandoned because I realized I couldn't, you know, even recently I just can't stick the, I can't stick the landing right. It doesn't work every time, but you know, sometimes uh, like for me, uh, I did a, very long article uh, last year on the mid julep and its African American history, for instance, and where where the African American in- influence is in American bartending and drinking, and that was that took a, just a crazy amount of research and work, and you know, other editors would have uh, you know pulled the plug on that pretty pretty early on, but uh, but fortunately, I have Noah who was like, all right, I know you, I know you're going to pull this in, and pull this around to something useful. And, you know, finally, I, I hope I did, but that's always uh, very encouraging, you know, and, and that's rare. I spent uh, 17 years writing for Esquire where I had like 750 words, you know, <laughs> done. And uh, that's probably one of the reasons yeah. I like to work uh, very long now is I can put in all the detail I had to cut out. I mean, writing for Esquire was great. Don't get me wrong. Uh, that was very fun, but it was a different style of writing. It was everything had to be very snappy. Yeah. This is just kind of a top line summary. It was also different times too. I mean, like yeah, exactly. I remember, you know, years ago, I you know, I'd, we'd, I'd see you at different events, or you know, I, I you know, I was a long time subscriber to Esquire, and you know, occasionally write some other stuff since Dave had all the drinks coverage on lockdown. But I always thought, oh man, like Dave is so lucky, like he gets at the time originally like 200 words every month like who gets <laughs> 200 words a month to write about cocktails and i know it was like, it was incredible. rare like and then it's but it you know but it was terry sullivan had it like oh yeah i mean but that's but that's you know it, it's sort of with the evolution i mean it, i think people mm-hmm. we've come so far it now it almost seems ludicrous when we talk about what drinks were like even 15 years ago 20 years ago i mean it, it, it's people it's like they think that you're exaggerating but it, it really was pretty pretty bad the you know the drinks culture in america at the time i mean to, to put it politely i was very lucky because i got to do a lot of just basic stuff that just hadn't been written about you know and uh oh yeah it was all just lying there on the ground you know just to be picked up i was I, in, in a lot of cases i was like the you know the guy who gets first let into the field you know, and, uh, oh, yeah. here's all the, here's all the, all the windfall fruit. I don't even have to go up in a tree, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I just got to pick it up off the ground, put it in my basket and go out the other side and I'm done. And I've got enough for a year. Now it's a lot harder. Yeah. Well, but even when Imbibe came out, I remember thinking, 
what's the like okay like this is like like this like at the time it was a landmark book but when you put it in the context of the fact that like nobody really was like the, the level of interest that we have today was not that when imbibe came out so no, like it it's not. even more groundbreaking looking back i mean like if you put it out now it's like yeah of course like this is a, <laughs> like this is a great idea but at the time i mean it was really pretty groundbreaking in that it was hard to get any drinks book published i mean like you know there were probably you'd go to the barnes and noble and there were 10 books and most of them you know paul packholt and gary regan and anthony dias blue had written and that was it i mean there were like 10 or 12, there's one shelf yeah. i mean now you go into barnes and noble there are three bookcases just for drinks books but at the time it was one shelf and publishers were not interested they just weren't so the fact that like you were able to get and buy out there is the, i mean the number of people who turned that book down <laughs> it's really quite right. something you know I was, it's amazing i was uh, for a while there i was despairing i was ever going to get it published after i did all this work on the proposal and i'm like oh god damn it you unbelievable know, i'm gonna you know just uh, <laughs> go back to uh, writing about what scotch i'm drinking today uh, not that there's anything wrong with that. That's we're, a pleasant job, but, uh, you know, I, I, there was more to be, I think we're all discussed. happy that you were, that you found the publisher for that book. And I certainly am. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was sort of one of those huge, I mean, even the punch book, I, I kept thinking, I remember talking to you about this at whiskey fest years ago and you said, yeah. Oh, like, yeah, mom, I'm, I'm like deep in this punch book thing. And I'm thinking punch, like, like Dave, like, I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, is, you know, this is pretty far out there, like even for you. But it, but you were right, obviously. Well, right and sort of right, uh, because that book only earned out last year. So it had been out for 10 years. But, but almost immediately you had bars that never would have had punch on their menu. That's punch true. Was, was suddenly, you know, the dead rabbit opens. They bought out some store, all of their punch balls, like somewhere mm -hmm. in Chinatown, I think, you know. Julie Reiner, Clover Club. I mean, basically, bars across the country are suddenly putting punch on their menu. Never would. I mean, our the whole kind of our. It's one of those things where you realize, especially doing the project like the Oxford Project, you know, you realize that sometimes our, you know, like, oh yeah, yeah, we know the history of cocktails, or like we know the history of this theory. And you realize once you start looking into it, it's just how shallow, yeah, everybody's knowledge really is. I mean, collectively, in that. In fact, including none your of own. us actually know <laughs> yeah. that. Right. Oh, completely. Like yeah. embarrassingly so. You embarrassingly realize, so. Oh my God. This none of this is right. Like nobody's looked into this. Nobody's fact checked this. Like this, if you look do a simple newspaper search, and, and obviously, you know, every year the amount of stuff that we can look through and find only gets better and better as more stuff gets mm -hmm. digitized and more libraries come online. So I mean, some of it's just the we didn't have access to a lot of this stuff even five, 10 years ago. We didn't even know it existed. There was no way of finding no, out. No, I mean, I, yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, every, you know, working on the Oxford book now, it's like, oh my God, if we had access to this 10 years ago, but it's just funny. It's like, you know, one of these giant moments where you realize, yeah, we weren't right about that. <laughs> like, this is actually a mistake, you know, that this is, so it turns out it's really X and not Y, you know, and some of those stories are wonderful, but, you know, but not true. Get it, getting back to the Oxford book for a minute, that was one of the big challenges. And one of the reasons it took so long is we were putting this book together in the middle of an information revolution. Yeah. You know, and what uh, when the book was proposed, what was doable and when the book was finished, what was not only doable, but had become necessary were two completely different things. You know, now it's like I'm fact checking this and suddenly I found that all of the stories that have been told about this, uh, let's say this brand for the last uh, 40 years, everything in print <laughs> is completely wrong, <laughs> you know, right. and is, uh, is a figment of their marketing department uh, that they completely forgot the origins of the brand at some point and made something up and then made that uh, be the truth. But in fact, here's documents that this was not the truth, that the brand is either older or younger or somebody else was doing it or uh, what, you know, the, it just gets incredibly complicated. And so much is just streamlined out. I mean, whether, yeah. you know, and I don't, I don't, and, and I don't think it's, I don't think people are doing this for nefarious reasons. It's just sort of, you know, this wasn't something that people really cared about. No, they didn't have any sources either, you know? 
No, and, and and a lot of this nobody really, you know, it's it just sort of gets streamlined out of the brand story. So, you know, and and you know, it's what appeared in advertising or press releases or people were able to find or heard secondhand and it's, yeah they've got a file of their old ads and uh you know in the marketing department and their old ads say we were founded in 1813 and in fact uh you know 1813 <laughs> was what the, the the year that the family bought the land where the distillery was eventually built <laughs> you know it's something like that and then and then sometimes some of the stuff is true but that's also hard too because you're double checking or triple checking that it's actually true Right. Yeah. That like, could this actually possibly be the truth? Like, it's so crazy. But yes, it is actually. <laughs> it is. Like, oh, yes, that is the I right mean, person. And as far as I can tell, Joe Sheridan really did like make the Irish coffee, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> and it was as at, impossible at, as that at, seems. But yeah. Yeah. There, there's stuff like that that just is, is bafflingly true. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Near Country Provisions. If you're like me, here are some things you might be like. You live in the Mid-Atlantic. You enjoy meat. You highly prefer that your meat is local, sustainable, and comes from ethically raised animals. And you'd absolutely love for someone to deliver it to your door once a month. If this sounds like you, then you need Near Country Provisions in your life. Head over to nearcountry.com and check out their different, highly customizable meat delivery packages and also browse their growing seafood selection. As a thank you for being a Modern Bar Cart listener, you can get two free pounds of ground beef or bacon included in your first order after subscribing if you enter the code BARCART, all one word, at checkout. That's BARCART, B-A-R-C-A-R-T, at checkout. Near Country Provisions is the real deal, and I can honestly say that I'd recommend them even if they weren't a sponsor. The meat and the local farmers they work with are just that good. Now, back to the show. Well, this sounds like a a great time to jump into a little bit more about the Oxford Companion to Spirits and Cocktails. I completely relate to what you're saying about research. I was recently... I'm doing a series on the Bloody Mary cocktail called Breaking Bloody, where each episode oh, we, we just look that. at one one specific yeah <laughs> one specific yeah. aspect of it. So we did a tomato episode, we did you know a a, a spice two part spice episode with horseradish and and capsaicin, and then in researching the umami episode, uh, you know I I even you know was able to dig up some stuff that called into question the entire origin story of Lee and Perrin's horseradish or um, Worcestershire sauce and, uh, and was had to get in contact with the, the people responsible for that, you know, minor noble families, historical records in, in the UK. And they're like, yeah, yeah, he really didn't go to India and, and find a fish sauce recipe in India. So, you know, we don't know what to say, but (laughs) he he really wasn't there. So anyway, uh, and the Heinz Corporation declined to comment. You know, that happens more often than not, though. I mean, there's uh, there's a lot of stuff like that. It, it's after a while, you know, you can end up, uh, which is, is a big fault of mine, just going down endless rabbit holes. But uh, yeah. on the other hand, sometimes there's very interesting stuff in those holes. And, uh, oh, yeah. you, you know, you pull it out and into the light of day and it's it's fascinating. It's fascinating, but it's not easy. It's time consuming for sure. Or you find stuff that you don't, you weren't looking for. Right. Yeah. Like, but like it's mind blowing and like you could never have unearthed because you didn't know it existed, but because you're searching for like Lee and Perrins and whatever, there's another article on that page that has some other crazy story that you're just like, Oh my God, like, what is this? And I, you know, that's, I think it's the author Laura Hillenbrand, right? Who who did on um, what the one about Sea Biscuit and yeah, like yeah. you know the Unbroken and and she actually reads old newspapers and part of the reason she likes it is that it gives her other ideas because you know when you're looking for one thing you find what other people are reading and I think that's how she found the Unbroken story. But like you know that happens all the time where you're oh, looking yeah. for one thing and you discover or or you realize okay like you know you have a drink like, you know, the Manhattan and there are a lot of people who are putting together whiskey or gin with sweet and dry vermouth 
you know, that there's a lot of people experimenting with the same ingredients and that maybe it's not so much who's the first person to do it, but who like publicized it. Right? And I think the Bloody Mary is one of those too, where you have a lot of like antecedents, right? That, you know, you've a lot of drinks that kind of feed into that and a lot of people playing with these ingredients and whether or not the person's first, it may not matter, but it's the one who's who's who kind of puts it out there and gets everybody's attention and gets all the PR. And that's sometimes almost even more important than who first put it together, since a lot of people probably put some of these recipes together. And, and, and a lot of them may or may not ever, we may never know about them because, you know, unless they were, you know, in the right place at the right time, nobody would ever write about mm-hmm. them. Yeah, I think the process that you're both describing right now with with the rabbit hole approach to uh, either journalism <laughs> or book writing is uh, maybe maybe we should think of it instead that that Noah and Dave are out noodling for catfish. And when you stick your arm <laughs> shoulder deep into the catfish <laughs> hole, sometimes you right. pull out a muskrat, but sometimes I mean, that muskrat is useful. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Or uh, tire or like, you know, or an old can or. Uh, yeah, know. but there's a lot of good eating on a muskrat. <laughs> <laughs> it seems a little bit like lunacy. I mean, because again, it again, I mean, Dave's right. I, like with some of this, it's also knowing that you have to stop right because you could go down some of these these trails forever right and they're you know even old newspapers or old books from 150 years ago don't always agree with each other just as they don't today so you know you're you're suddenly and and then you realize wow this is a detail that nobody really cares about perhaps except for me or like you know two other (laughs) people that i can just summarize the fact that like you know even for like we've been debating this topic for 150 years or 200 years and 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 that alone is is interesting you know that we don't really you know for two centuries nobody's known the answer and that it's been a debate is is also of importance i think i mean it's like the history of the manhattan cocktail has been debated since the 1890s which is about 10 years after it first appears in print. So, you know, and, uh, right. and ever since it has been a subject of debate. So uh, I don't think we'll ever get to the bottom of that one. Uh, I mean, the people who are in a position to know didn't know. So the more certain people are about some of these things, the less I'm now inclined to believe them, you yeah. know, like those people who are like, I know the, I know the truth about the Manhattan. I know the truth about the martini. I know it's like, Oh, do you like <laughs> there should be a <laughs> uh, some secret book that you've discovered? I mean, it's like all the people saying, you know, the Sazerac cocktail was originally with cognac, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I used to say that, too, because I that was the research I had available. And now it turns out hmm, there really wasn't such a thing uh, as, as a Sazerac cocktail until late in the uh, in the 19th century. And all that early stuff was just uh, something that Stanley Quisby Arthur made up. A lot of this stuff, it's history that happens in bars and you're never going to get to the bottom of it because uh, it never got written down in the first place. And uh, it was never documentary history. It was oral history. And you're stuck with that. Right. So I imagine that makes putting together something like the Oxford Companion to spirit some cocktails <laughs> rather challenging. We, we've already talked about the oh. fact that, uh, yeah. you know, it, it took Dave a couple of years solo, who then pulled in Noah and... From what I understand, there are also a number of other contributors. So can you explain to our listeners what got this book across the finish line to the point where it is now going to be released in a few months? Yeah, we have over 150 contributors is what got it over the finish line. <laughs> and uh, you know, a lot of people pitched in to write articles. Uh, I mean, too many to, 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 to name here. Other, you know, You've already mentioned a couple, Matt Rowley and... Uh, Paul Clark, uh, Dave Broom, Lou Bryson, uh, the list goes on, Kara Newman, uh, uh, you know, many spirits writers, many distillers, many uh, historians, academics, uh, bartenders, uh, yeah. bartenders, uh, because it's spirits and cocktails. So we couldn't use traditional academic uh, sources for a lot of this. You can't really get a lot of professors to say anything comprehensible about bartending. Because, uh, you know, they're not good bartenders. Uh, We needed like skilled bartenders. And, you know, uh, it it was just an extraordinarily wide net of people. And uh, 
some, you know, really some people are specialists. Other people were great generalists who knew how to get to the bottom of this. And then we had to edit it all together and, you know, attempt to harmonize it. So we don't have 12 different oranges origins for the uh, Manhattan in this book. So, so it, it's, it was a, a lot of, uh, of work. Uh, we have a great editorial team at first here in America at Oxford University Press, and eventually it got transferred over to a team over there at Oxford who were just amazing. Having something to do during the pandemic helped, I have to say, while being stuck at home. One of the things that kept the project going so long is it was never a full-time job because, you know, it doesn't pay full-time. We had to do it in between traveling and writing for other things. And this, the big slowdown during the pandemic enabled me personally, at least, to focus on this to an unprecedented degree. I wasn't flying all over the world and doing stuff. So... Uh, that helped to get it done. It's it's sad and uh, and ironic, but it did help to push it across the finish line. It was definitely a, a labor of love, and and I think it you know part of a project like this is that you have to realize that the first year and a half, two years, it was just a lot of it was figuring out what the book would contain. Right? I mean, there there are what I mean, how many entries? Twelve hundred entries, something yeah. like that. I've tried to. I have the stuff of nightmares, right? Like yeah, a little under twelve hundred. A little under twelve hundred. I had to edit every single one of them. <laughs> so I'm trying to forget some of these. I oh forget my god! Really detailed. Endless. Um, it, it was an endless number. And, and because it's like it was, you know, it was first coming up with a list of what what would these entries be? What entries? You know, some of them are obvious, some of them are less obvious. And then it was, who do we want to write these entries? And it was approaching. You know, uh, you know, approached, you know, all of our contributors and others. Some people, you know, couldn't do it. Some people couldn't do it at the time, but we were working on it for so long. We'd come back to them out of desperation. They'd agree, you know, beg yeah. and plead. And by that point, they could do it. You know, the, whatever other project they were working on is now finished. So they could do it. Other people we could never get or, you know, uh, people, you know, certain of the topics, you know, are really interesting, but very obscure. And nobody really wanted to tackle those. So, I mean, Dave wound up taking a lot of... Yeah, I ended up having to cover a lot of those. That was that was uh, difficult. <laughs> but then, and then we found also a lot of amazing, you know, uh, people to write these articles all over oh, the yeah. world, you know, oh, yeah. and ones that, you know, really, you know, they may not be traditional drinks or spirits writers, but they have a lot or, or bartenders, but they have a lot of academic knowledge about certain, you know, obscure topics that lend themselves to this and, you know, trying to tell sort of a bigger story that's cross referenced so that like, you know, and it goes, you know, it's about spirits and cocktails all over the world. You know, it's one of these amazing things when you when you start to do it, it's at, at points it just never seems like it's gonna ever end because you know, it's like, who, who could we possibly find to write about X or Y? And, and between our different networks and, you know, our advisory board, um, our editorial board, their connections, we were able to find people all over the world to, to write these amazing entries. So, uh, but <laughs> oh, I think yeah. Dave and I are still like, still <laughs> we're, not, we're stunned. <laughs> we're still waiting for them to be like, oh yeah, we forgot this back to 400 entries that you need to take a look yeah. at tomorrow. Oh, but, no. <laughs> uh, but, but, but but it will be out in October. It's too late for that. So whatever it is, it is. It will be out in October, and uh, we can't wait to uh, see it. Yeah, I can't wait to see it. Uh, it's, uh, you know, there there, there have been other books that are very large, similar books, but we kind of took a different tack in that we said, all right, those books tend to cover a few spirits in great detail. And we said, we're going to try to, like, do more with South America and Asia and Africa and uh, get, you know, more into like some of the past, the, the foundations of these spirits and less on, you know, what we can glean from modern distilleries uh, because that stuff is, is pretty widely available. We're, you know, we were conscious of things like, such as Wikipedia that, you know, okay, there's a lot of information. <laughs> I've heard of it. On, We've heard of that uh, on the modern world in that. And it starts to get very thin when you start getting back anytime before 1900. So let's try to focus 
on the questions that are harder to answer and uh, get a little more of that information in if possible. And so we spent a lot of time on that, on, on things like, you know, yeah. uh, I don't know, medieval distilling and uh, origins of rum and, uh, and questions like that. So uh, that, that, that took uh, quite a bit of work. Uh, Which again, we, I mean, a lot of these things that I think naively I thought, you know, okay, like, you know, we, we, we've got the history of rum, like pretty much done. And then Dave is like, well, <laughs> I think it's a lot longer. I think it goes back another thousand years. And it's like, okay. Uh, <laughs> like, yeah. um, we got, we got to actually uh, open this one up again. <laughs> right. We got to look, oh, now well. we're looking into spirits made from, you know, king sugar. And it's fascinating. I mean, it's, that's, and hopefully, you know, we wanted a book where people, whether they've, you know, know a lot, they know a little, but they're interested, will find something new and, and, and new information. And we're able to, you know, include and a new lot perspectives of perspectives also. Exactly. And, 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 you know, not the same stuff that's in every, you know, that that's in every book or on Wikipedia or in every article, but stuff that really kind of tries to go a little bit farther. And that, to be honest, that's really why it took so long. I mean, it's our contributors, you know, um, went the extra mile and Dave, you know, opened up the vault of his archives too, and, you know, filled in a lot of really interesting info. And, you know, we had Eric Metzger, the wonderful photographer, shoot the cover. So that's, you know, it's a beautiful eye catching, you know, uh, image that hopefully people will love putting on their coffee tables mm -hmm. or, you know, in restaurants and bars, you know, it's, uh, very, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful book if I do say so myself. Mm. So, uh, you know, we're, we're looking forward to, to getting it in our hands. <laughs> <laughs> Any day. We'll work out oh. with it. At work. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. I, I think what you're both describing is sort of the Delta, you know, Dave, you just, you, you mentioned that, you know, back in 1999 in the early two thousands, it seemed like you were just walking around an orchard, picking up, you know, the, the windfall mm -hmm. from the previous evening. And it was just sitting there, you know, shiny on the ground, looking up at you. And now it seems like, you know, in this attempt to go back further to the times that we don't have as much information on, you know, you're describing a, a slightly different knowledge landscape. And, and so it makes sense oh, to very. me that this type of writing and this process that you're describing is what logically follows all of the work that you've done before, because once you clean up the orchard, then it's time to, you know, take out the ladder and, and get what hasn't fallen yet. And, and uh, to, to me, it makes a whole lot of sense. So I was wondering if maybe either or both of you had one or two little entries or stories that you either fought hard to keep in or regret that you maybe had to uh, cut from the book just to give our listeners a little more specific taste. I don't know about, we, we were able to we didn't cut that much. We didn't cut that much. <laughs> what, there are stories I wish that we had had time to cover, though. Mm -hmm. I would love to do, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get a second edition and we'll get to do more on, uh, for instance, uh, palm spirits from around the world, which go have a long history. I'd like to do more on South American sugarcane spirits. There's like there's some amazing stuff in South America. In Paraguay, for instance, they make this stuff, con they call it Kanye, just cane spirit. And uh, by law, it has to be fermented in bull's hide fermenters. That goes back to the early, earliest days of Spanish colonization, right? When they use such things. They, that, that is just so weird and old. And it has to be made from cane syrup that has been boiled down over an open flame. <laughs> a wooden flame, wow. no less. So, I mean, they're, they're preserving this like crazy uh, 17th century tradition, maybe even older. And, you know, that's Paraguay. Nobody knows anything about Paraguay in America, in the U.S. Nobody goes there from, from here. We, we don't have like a big tourist trade. It's a landlocked country in the foothills of the Andes. And uh, it has just phenomenal traditions. There's Cañazo cane spirit from... Uh, Peru that goes back also to the early 1600s and maybe even before. And that's got traditions that we don't know anything about. And I would love to study that. You know, I would love to have detailed coverage on those things, on things like that, on some of the uh, 
cassava spirits in Africa that go back, we don't know how long. Cane spirits there also that uh, it seems like some of them might go back to the uh, 1600s as well. Uh, so there's all kinds of stuff like that, you know, that just uh, we cover a little bit because we realized it was there, but we haven't had time to travel to the region or find writers who live in the region who, uh, you know, we just don't have the contacts because we don't, we just haven't been there. Uh, and uh, a big part of uh, putting this book together was having traveled all over and knowing who lives there and knowing the writers there that we could call up and get to uh, get to do an article. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's been kind of uh, an eye opener and the things that we touched on are, there are many things like that, that I would love to develop, you know, in the future and go into detail and uh, find the complications there. Noah, anything for you? Well, I, we also had a kind of cut off, like do a cut off, like period. Oh, good kind point. Of, like so, like what? What did we we brought it two thousand seven? Is that the? I can't remember what. Roughly, I think it was two thousand four. Uh, was the two thousand four? Because I mean, when we started, I mean, it was you know twenty fourteen, so it was ten years. You know, so there's a lot of stuff that's obviously happened in the last. 15 years, which could fill its own volume. So. I mean, that doesn't mean we didn't cover it, but, but we, uh, we had to cut off individual entries on like people who made their mark. Uh, anybody after 2004 went into one of the uh, compound, you know, the kind of the, the general coverage entries, because otherwise uh, in 2004, the cocktail world and the, and the, the uh, spirits world were still small. Uh, then, by 2007, they were huge, <laughs> and we just <laughs> and we couldn't so, cover. I them mean, all. so sorry, sorry, Noah, sorry to interrupt. Oh no, no, that's that's no. I think that's exactly it. I mean, so hopefully, in addition to, we'll fill in, you know, the sort of modern history and, and a lot of that's sort of been unfolding, you know, as we wrote. So, you know, again, not knowing exactly when this would publish, so you know, we had to cut it off at some date. So. Hopefully, edition two or three will fill in, you know, a lot of the modern history. So there's a lot of interesting stuff that, um, you know, we, we couldn't do for this edition, but hopefully in future editions that will cover, you know, all the amazing things that have happened uh, over the last 15 years or so. Amazing. Amazing. Well, I think that's the that's the beauty of catalog as a and and to a, a, a different extent, dictionary and or encyclopedia as as a form is that, you know, what it, it, it contains as many entries as it contains. And uh, if it needs more, it can it can handle more down the road. So uh, I know that we're all very excited for those as well. Just give us the details on when it's going to be released. I, October, correct? October 14th. Uh, in the U.S. and U.K. So okay, and uh, did all those Oxford editors uh, stick in U's and swap out Z's with S's on us, or are we going to get a get a clean version here? Uh, we're getting the American version because this was generated here in America. It was by Oxford right. uh, University Press USA. So uh, uh, we do have to use the Oxford comma, though. I'm afraid uh, that that they were very firm on. <laughs> I, your name is on the cover so I, you know we're locked yeah. in there. <laughs> yeah. all right that, that's fair if there's one sacrifice to be made i think that's that's one that's uh that's acceptable exactly. yeah yeah that, that wasn't so hard so I, I just wanted to quickly loop back to Life Behind Bars and uh, assuming that our listeners will also be interested in the spirits and cocktail content that you both cover, do you have any favorite episodes or, or uh, episodes that you might recommend for somebody just getting into Life Behind Bars? I know that my favorite episode is the one where you both were talking about sourcing all of those old bottles, like kind of going to liquor stores and looking for the dusties. Uh -huh. But uh, what about what about you both? Um, we, I, there, there are a lot of good ones. I mean, it's, it's funny. We're, we're, we're coming up to our hundredth episode. So not, not quite the 200. No, 200 but, is very impressive. Come, <laughs> yeah. 200 is 200 seems impossible, but when we're about, we're, 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 we're close to 100. And, um, I don't know. It's, it's really interesting. Like, you know, going back, you know, some of the, the episodes, uh, we, we did one that I really, I really enjoyed recording, which was one about, I think it's called the Donald Trump curse, New York's Tiki bars. And like, you know, he <laughs> closed the last Trader Vic's 
when he owned the plaza, he called it too tacky. I won't comment, but, um, you know, and ever since, you know, he closed Trader Vic's, it's been very hard for a tiki bar to stay open in New York. And, and I think that's, that was, that was a, that was an interesting episode. Um, and then, um, that was a fun one also. Uh, we did one with, uh, recently with Jeff Beach Bumberry, um, about, uh, the history of the pina colada, which was, which was a lot of fun. And, uh, his, you know, it turns out he's not well, particularly because he hates that drink, <laughs> <laughs> which we didn't realize until he started really recording it. He's he's quite he's quite militant about his outrage about the drink, but was was kind enough to offer you know his kind of ingenious tweak on the standard recipe to make it an even better drink. Um, and we shall happily make for you in New Orleans at his bar, uh, on a two forty nine, or you can make it home. But, but that was a fun one because he was just so angry. We did another one with Wayne Curtis about all the amazing drinks that they make on, um, bourbon street. Um, you know, and all those crazy cups and, you know, outrageous names like the shark attack and, you know, mm-hmm. the, the hand grenade. And, and, and it turns out that it's like basically, you know, one bar, started that whole that whole craze for really outlandish drinks and sort of theater and stuff so that was that was a really fun one you know we did a series last fall that was you know in the middle of the pandemic about what you know i think it was four episodes with bartenders and each episode had four bartenders sort of talking to them about you know what they were doing to try to pivot and and make their bars you know, allow their bars to stay open during the, the worst parts mm-hmm. of the pandemic. So that was, that was, uh, those were really some pretty amazing conversations. And, um, I think really capture, you know, what, what a hard year and a half it's been for, for people and who own bars and run bars and are bartenders and bar vacs and at what great lengths people went to, to, to try to save their bars. So those are four pretty, um, amazing episodes that I, I'm pretty proud of. Yeah. Oh, I mean, the amazing people we had on them for sure. Well, I definitely recommend that our listeners check out Life Behind Bars as well. Like I said, it's part of my um, my regular listening diet. And, uh, you know, between the podcast that you two have put together and the uh, all the work that you've done on the Oxford Companion to Spirits and Cocktails, you know, I, I will echo the sentiment about the last year and a half, but it, you've been doing... You've, you've, you've almost got this bolus of work that had been taking place <laughs> up to the the pandemic. And now it's almost like the momentum has finally brought it around. And, and I'm ex- this is this is something something from the before times that we can we can resurrect with this book. And so that's that's another reason why I'm excited to um, to to enjoy it here. And we're uh, also planning on carrying this book on our e-commerce site. So when uh, when it launches, uh, hopefully we'll be uh, We'll, we'll do some some fun giveaways and stuff like that. So uh, everybody stay tuned for more info on that in October. But uh, I wanted to see if there was anything else you fellas wanted to mention here before we jumped into a couple quick lightning round questions. I say fire away. Yeah, I say fire <laughs> away. Exactly. All right. This is the one that uh, most bartenders hate. And I, I assume that, that you'll hate it maybe slightly less, but we'll give you it out here. What is your favorite cocktail? And if you don't have a favorite of all time, what's something that you've been uh, sort of obsessed with lately? Uh, rum punch. Any particular, <laughs> is it just, just, just any rum punch? Is there a particular ratio you go for? Uh, it, it's, it's a capacious house. Okay. There are many ways of making rum, <laughs> rum punch. That's why that's why it's my favorite drink. Because if I have to pick one, you know, there are a million different ways of doing it. Amazing. Uh, it's just rum and limes. So I, I'm I'm going to choose a similar path. Um, I, recently and, and really, uh, you know, for the last year, I, I find myself whenever making drinks, usually making some version of the sour cocktail. You know, some you know whether it's a daiquiri or dark and stormy or French seventy five, but and what I love about it is that, like, usually there's, I mean, obviously there's spirits in my house, but if, you know, if there's somewhere <laughs> there else, there's be. usually spirit. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. There's citrus and then, you know, some kind of sweetener and you can make a delicious cocktail, you know, out of those three ingredients, uh, you know, an endless combination. So, you know, you can sort of go from one to the next to the next and just uh you know change things slightly and it's they're quick they're easy they're delicious mm-hmm. usually no fail um, people are always impressed by them even no matter how 
no matter if you reveal like it's just three ingredients, they, they, they insist that you're hiding something, some, something that you're not telling them the full recipe. But, uh, uh, but yeah, the, that usually is, is my go-to. Yeah. In some respects, the sour truly is the hero with many faces. Uh, it's, it's a fun one. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Margarita, daiquiri, whatever you, you know, it's, it's rum punch. Of, uh, fan favorite. <laughs> rum punch. I mean, exactly. <laughs> All right. Next question. Uh, cocktail with anyone past or present, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you drink? Just paint us a picture. Noah. Well, I, I mean, I could be a jerk and I could just say Jerry Thomas, right? Because <laughs> I know Dave is going to say that, right? So <laughs> I'm not going to say Jerry Thomas. But um, that's a great question. I, I'm I'm going to go a little bit uh, out of the box here. I think um, I think Louis Armstrong, like that would be incredible to, uh, to sit down and uh, have a cocktail with him and, and hear all of his stories. And, uh, you know, just what an incredible life and, and to hear all about it would be. I mean, beyond a delight. So, do you have anywhere in New York or otherwise that uh, that that would ideally take place? I mean, I, I mean, you know, he pa- he he passed away. He was living in Corona, Queens, but I think probably you know he was born in New Orleans, New Orleans, and I think uh, or New Orleans or Wayne is always busting on me for how I say it. So now I can never remember. But um, it would be nice to have a. Uh, <laughs> Cocktail <laughs> with uh, Louis Armstrong down in in, in Nola. Um, we should be, uh, would be awesome. Nice. Dave is 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 uh is Noah's prediction correct? No, it's not. Uh, I'm going to say Whoa. Noah Rothbaum <laughs> because uh, <laughs> we haven't had to have we haven't had a chance to have our victory lap for getting in this manuscript yet, and uh, it's been too long. So uh, I'm going to say Noah, and it's not going to be a cocktail. It's going to be beer at McSorley's, and it'll be soon. <laughs> that sounds great. Yeah, I love it at that table in the front by the window. So uh, there we go. (laughs) All right. Last one to wrap up here. Uh, What is a controversial view or belief that you hold in the spirits and cocktail world, Dave? I've got nothing against fine ice shards in a drink. That's one way. uh, Let let, let me just step back. I believe that it (laughs) is possible to be way too picky in your uh, in how you want your cocktails. So uh, I believe uh, that you can actually really uh, cut off your nose to spite your, spa- your face with, uh, with cocktail uh, pickiness and uh, technique. So, Amen. Noah? I, I think I, I, I usually do the corollary, which is, I mean, it sounds, it sounds silly, but uh, rarely do people do this. I think people should drink what makes them happy. You yeah. know, and if that's... If that's a mudslide, then, you know, wonderful. I hope it's the best mudslide that you can make, you know, and if Dave and I can help you with podcasts or the book or our stories, great. You know what I mean? And if not, you know, enjoy our stuff while you drink your mud, your mudslide <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, cheers, you know, we'll drink something else. You drink that, you drink what that makes you happy. We'll drink what makes us happy and we'll go from there. But I, I don't, I don't feel like there's a need to shame people to make fun of people, uh, to intimidate them into drinking other things. If this is something that makes you happy, then, then you should try it. Hold your hat, but I think I'm about to file 12,000 words on the mudslide. So. <laughs> Great. I'd love it. I'd love it. That'd be amazing. <laughs> that would be amazing. Uh, wonderful. Well, gentlemen, uh, this has been a pleasure. Uh, it's really fun to dig into not only the, the, the hits and highlights like imbibe and punch and the daily beast and the, uh, the, the whole, you know, sweep of of time that led up to the oxford companion to spirits and cocktails but also to to learn how things have changed over that time because i i think that's something that is a little bit lost on people in the day to day is is how things change over the over the course of years and decades and and i I definitely have a, a better appreciation of that having had this conversation with you uh what quickly is the best place for people to go to learn more about the Oxford Companion to Spirits and Cocktails and what are the best ways to reach out to you two in the digital space? Well, for, for the first, uh, Oxford University Press, uh, it's uh, a book that's featured prominently on their website. And so that's probably the best place personally to reach out to me. Twitter always works uh, at David Wandrich. <laughs> I'm not... Uh, I'm not hiding. So uh, that's probably your best bet. 
or find me at one of my local bars. <laughs> I'd say the same thing for Twitter and Ralph Baum. You know, Dave and I are usually pretty active on uh, on uh, the Twitter sphere. So uh, reach out, questions, comments, uh, how you like the book, stories. Uh, we're pretty good about getting back or even just photos of favorite drinks. We always love to see uh, when people have listened to or heard an episode or, you know, read one of our stories and then uh, had one of the drinks that's mentioned. So we'll look out for you on Twitter. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, we will have links to all of the Oxford University press stuff over on the show notes page, of course, and, and some of the other things we discussed, like the Plato and Aristotle story. And uh, I do encourage all of our listeners to keep your eyes open and your ears open for uh, when this book becomes available in mid-October. And uh, like I mentioned, we're hoping to carry it over on modernbarcart.com. So you can always come and just check out our store out if you need to pick up your copy. Once again, Noah, Dave, thank you so much for being guests here on the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. Thank you so much, Eric. It's been a pleasure and uh, thanks for supporting the book and uh, our stuff. We greatly appreciate it. And uh, I'll, I'll be keeping my fingers crossed that we can have a drink together soon. Amen. Thank you, Eric. Cheers. 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 Hey everybody, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and sound design by Samantha Reed, cocktail history and editorial insights courtesy of Noah Rothbaum and David Wondrich, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2021.